Chapter Three of Sir Dominic Ferrand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. Sir Dominic Ferrand by Henry James. Chapter Three. Ten days after Mrs. Rives's visit, he paid by appointment another call on the editor of the Promiscuous. He found him in the little wainscoted Chelsea house, which had to Peter's sense the smoky brownness of an old pipe-bowl, surrounded with all the emblems of his office, a litter of papers, a hedge of encyclopedias, a photographic gallery of popular contributors, and he promised at first to consume very few of the moments for which so many claims competed. It was Mr. Lockett himself, however, who presently made the interview spacious, gave it air after discovering that poor Baron had come to tell him something more interesting than that he couldn't, after all, patch up his tale. Peter had begun with this, had intimated respectfully that it was a case in which both practice and principle rebelled, and then, perceiving how little Mr. Lockett was affected by his audacity, had felt weak and slightly silly, left with his heroism on his hands. He had armed himself for a struggle, but the promiscuous didn't even protest, and there would have been nothing for him but to go away with the prospect of never coming again, had he not chanced to say abruptly, irrelevantly, as soon as he got up from his chair, "'Do you happen to be at all interested in Sir Dominic Ferrand?' Mr. Lockett, who had also got up, looked over his glasses. "'The late Sir Dominic?' "'The only one. You know the family's extinct.' Mr. Lockett shot his young friend another sharp glance, a silent retort to the glibness of this information. "'Very extinct indeed. I'm afraid the subject to-day would scarcely be regarded as attractive.' "'Are you very sure?' Baron asked. Mr. Lockett leaned forward a little with his fingertips on his table, in the attitude of giving permission to retire. "'I might consider the question in a special connection.' He was silent a minute, in a way that relegated poor Peter to the general, but meeting the young man's eyes again, he asked, "'Are you, uh, thinking of proposing an article upon him?' "'Not exactly proposing it, because I don't yet quite see my way, but the idea rather appeals to me.' Mr. Lockett omitted the safe assertion that this eminent statesman had been a striking figure in his day. Then he added, have you been studying him? I've been dipping into him. I'm afraid he's scarcely a question of the hour, said Mr. Lockett, shuffling papers together. I think I could make him one, Peter Baron declared. Mr. Lockett stared again. He was unable to repress an unattenuated you. I have some new material, said the young man, colouring a little. That often freshens up an old story. It buries it sometimes. It's often only another tombstone. That depends upon what it is. However, Peter added, the documents I speak of would be a crushing monument. Mr. Lockett, hesitating, shot another glance under his glasses. Do you allude to, uh, revelations? Very curious ones. Mr. Lockett, still on his feet, had kept his body at the bowing angle. It was therefore easy for him, after an instant, to bend a little further and to sink into his chair with a movement of his hand toward the seat Baron had occupied. Baron resumed possession of this convenience, and the conversation took a fresh start on a basis which such an extension of privilege could render but little less humiliating to our young man. He had matured no plan of confiding his secret to Mr. Lockett and he had really come out to make him conscientiously that other announcement, as to which it appeared that so much artistic agitation had been wasted. He had indeed during the past days, days of painful indecision, appealed in imagination to the editor of The Promiscuous, as he had appealed to other sources of comfort, but his scruples turned their face upon him from quarters high as well as low, and if on the one hand he had by no means made up his mind not to mention his strange knowledge, 
he had still more left to the determination of the moment the question of how he should introduce the subject. He was, in fact, too nervous to decide. He only felt that he needed for his peace of mind to communicate his discovery. He wanted an opinion, the impression of somebody else, and even in this intensely professional presence, five minutes after he had begun to tell his queer story, he felt relieved of half his burden. His story was very queer. He could take the measure of that himself as he spoke. But wouldn't this very circumstance qualify it for the promiscuous? "'Of course the letters may be forgeries,' said Mr. Lockett at last. "'I've no doubt that's what many people will say.' Have they been seen by any expert? No, indeed, they've been seen by nobody. Have you got any of them with you? No, I felt nervous about bringing them out. That's a pity. I should have liked the testimony of my eyes. You may have it if you'll come to my rooms. If you don't care to do that, without a further guarantee, I'll copy you out some passages. Select a few of the worst, Mr. Lockett laughed. Over Baron's distressing information he had become quite human and genial. But he added in a moment more dryly, "'You know they ought to be seen by an expert.' "'That's exactly what I dread,' said Peter. "'They'll be worth nothing to me if they're not.' Peter communed with his innermost spirit. "'How much will they be worth to me if they are?' Mr. Lockett turned in his study chair. I should require to look at them before answering that question. I've been to the British Museum. There are many of his letters there. I've obtained permission to see them, and I've compared everything carefully. I repudiate the possibility of forgery. No sign of genuineness is wanting. There are details, down to the very postmarks, that no forger could have invented. Besides, whose interest could it conceivably have been? a labour of unspeakable difficulty, and all for what advantage? There are so many letters, too, twenty-seven in all. "'Lord, what an ass!' Mr. Lockett exclaimed. "'It will be one of the strangest post-mortem revelations of which history preserves the record.' Mr. Lockett, grave now, worried with a paper-knife the crevice of a drawer. "'It's very odd.' but to be worth anything such documents should be subjected to a searching criticism, I mean, of the historical kind. Certainly, that would be the task of the writer introducing them to the public. Again Mr. Lockett considered, and then with a smile he looked up. You had better give up original composition and take to buying old furniture. Do you mean because it will pay better? For you, I should think, original composition couldn't pay worse. The creative faculty's so rare. I do feel tempted to turn my attention to real heroes, Peter replied. I'm bound to declare that Sir Dominic Ferrand was never one of mine. Flashy, crafty, second-rate. That's how I've always read him. It was never a secret, moreover, that his private life had its weak spots. He was a mere flash in the pan. He speaks to the people of this country, said Baron. He did, but his voice, the voice, I mean, of his prestige, is scarcely audible now. They're still proud of some of the things he did at the Foreign Office, the famous exchange with Spain and the Mediterranean, which took Europe so by surprise, and by which he felt injured, especially when it became apparent how much we had the best of the bargain. Then the sudden, unexpected show of force by which he imposed on the United States our interpretation of that tiresome treaty, I could never make out what it was about. These were both matters that no one really cared a straw about, but he made every one feel as if they cared. The nation rose to the way he played his trumps. It was uncommon. He was one of the few men we've had in our period who took Europe, or took America, by surprise, made them jump a bit and the country liked his doing it. It was a pleasant change. The rest of the world considered that they knew in any case exactly what we would do, which was usually nothing at all. Say what you like, he's still a high name, partly also, no doubt, on account of other things, his early success and early death, his political cheek and wit, his very appearance, he certainly was handsome, 
and the possibilities of future personal supremacy, which it was the fashion at the time, which it's the fashion still, to say had passed away with him. He had been twice at the Foreign Office. That alone was remarkable for a man dying at forty-four. What, therefore, will the country think when it learns he was venal? Peter Barron himself was not angry with Sir Dominic Ferrand, who had simply become to him, he had been reading up feverishly for a week, a very curious subject of psychological study. But he could easily put himself in the place of that portion of the public whose memory was long enough for their patriotism to receive a shock. It was some time, fortunately, since the conduct of public affairs had wanted for men of disinterested ability, but the extraordinary documents concealed, of all places in the world, it was as fantastic as a nightmare, in a bargain picked up at a second hand by an obscure scribbler, would be a calculable blow to the retrospective mind. Barron saw vividly that if these relics should be made public, the scandal, the horror, the chatter would be immense. Immense would be also the contribution to truth, the rectification of history. He had felt for several days, and it was exactly what made him so nervous, as if he held in his hand the key to public attention. "'There are too many things to explain,' Mr. Lockett went on, "'and the singular provenance of your papers would count almost overwhelmingly against them, even if the other objections were met. There would be a perfect and probably a very complicated pedigree to trace. How did they get into your Davenport, as you call it, and how long had they been there? What hands secreted them? What hands had so incredibly clung to them and preserved them? Who are the persons mentioned in them? Who are the correspondents, the parties to the nefarious transactions? You say the transactions appear to be of two distinct kinds some of them connected with public business, and others involving obscure personal relations. "'They all have this in common,' said Peter Barron, "'that they constitute evidence of uneasiness, in some instances of painful alarm on the writer's part, in relation to exposure. The exposure in the one case, as I gather, of the fact that he had availed himself of official opportunities to promote enterprises, public works and that sort of thing, in which he had a pecuniary stake. The dread of the light in the other connection is evidently different, and these letters are the earliest in date. They are addressed to a woman from whom he had evidently received money. Mr. Lockett wiped his glasses. What woman? I haven't the least idea. There are lots of questions I can't answer, of course, lots of identities I can't establish, lots of gaps I can't fill, but as to two points I'm clear and they are the essential ones. In the first place, the papers in my possession are genuine. In the second place, they're compromising." With this Peter Barron rose again, rather vexed with himself for having been led on to advertise his treasure. It was his interlocutor's perfectly natural scepticism that produced this effect, for he felt that he was putting himself in a false position. He detected in Mr. Lockett's studied detachment the fermentation of impulses from which, unsuccessful as he was, he himself prayed to be delivered. Mr. Lockett remained seated. He watched Baron go across the room for his hat and umbrella. Of course the question would come up of whose property today such documents would legally be. There are heirs, descendants, executors to consider. In some degree, perhaps, but I've gone into that a little. Sir Dominic Ferrand had no children, and he left no brothers and no sisters. His wife survived him, but she died ten years ago. He can have had no heirs, and no executors to speak of, for he left no property." "'That's to his honour and against your theory,' said Mr. Lockett. "'I have no theory. He left a largish mass of debt,' Peter Barron added. At this Mr. Lockett got up, while his visitor pursued. So far as I can ascertain, though of course my inquiries have had to be very rapid and superficial, there is no one now living, directly or indirectly related to the personage in question, who would be likely to suffer from any steps in the direction of publicity. It happens to be a rare instance of a life that had, as it were, no loose ends. At least there are none perceptible at present. 
"'I see, I see,' said Mr. Lockett. "'But I don't think I should care much for your article.' "'What article?' "'The one you seem to wish to write, embodying this new matter.' "'Oh, I don't wish to write it!' Peter exclaimed. And then he bade his host good-bye. "'Good-bye,' said Mr. Lockett. "'Mind you, I don't say that I think there's nothing in it.' "'You would think there was something in it if you were to see my documents.' "'I should like to see the secret compartment,' the caustic editor rejoined. "'Copy me out some extracts.' "'To what end, if there's no question of their being of use to you?' I don't say that. I might like the letters themselves. Themselves? Not as the basis of a paper, but just to publish for a sensation. They'd sell your number, Baron laughed. I dare say I should like to look at them, Mr. Lockett conceded after a moment. When should I find you at home? Don't come, said the young man. I make you no offer. I might make you one, the editor hinted. Don't trouble yourself. I shall probably destroy them. With this, Peter Baron took his departure, waiting, however, just afterwards, in the street near the house, as if he had been looking out for a stray hansom, to which he would not have signalled had it appeared. He thought Mr. Lockett might hurry after him, but Mr. Lockett seemed to have other things to do, and Peter Baron returned on foot to Jersey Villas. End of chapter 3